Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the latest edition of the Red Pill Fiction Factory. Coming to you from a slightly chilly Yucatan. We're down into the sort of 70s, which makes it quite cold by our standards. But where I, the person I'm talking to will know all about cold because he lives in Minnesota. His name is Kevin Kautzman. He's a playwright who works in IT, but he's also a screenwriter and hosts his own podcast, uh, highly recommended, which focuses on the dark side of the creative process. It's called The Art of Darkness, and I recommend you go to that. I'll put a link at the end about it. I met him on Twitter, the way I often meet people for this show, and today we're going to discuss his latest play, because he's written several. It's called Moderation. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Richard, thanks for having me on. I'm very well, thank you. And we are uh, having a balmy day here in St. Paul, Minnesota. It is 31 degrees or just below freezing. For the Celsius respecters out there, uh, it's just right at zero. So, To be honest, you make me jealous right now. Uh, it's been a very hot winter for us, mm. barely any respite. But um, mm. So tell us more. Where are you from? Um, what's your background? And what was your life all about until you got to this point in uh, St. Paul? <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, nothing major. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm originally from North Dakota. Uh, I'm from the wrong side of the river at the wrong time in the wrong state is what I say. It's a bit of a joke. Uh, I was actually born in Bismarck, but I was largely raised in Mandan, North Dakota, which is across the river from Bismarck. It's kind of one big metro. I mean, metro There's maybe 100,000 people out there. Um, I uh, very good people. I got out as fast as I could. I moved when I was 17 to Minnesota here to go to the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, which has kind of become ground zero for a lot of different things now, but maybe we'll talk about that later. Uh, I studied history and philosophy at the University of Minnesota. Uh, very good school. Go Gophers. Still a big Gopher football fan. Uh, and then I worked a little bit in, for a startup, uh, like a like a tech startup, a K twelve education recruitment company. I had the opportunity to to go to London. Uh, yeah, I was working remotely, so I had through sort of course of life, I got to spend a year in London, and it was just prior to that that I had really kind of been bitten by the theater bug. Uh, I had gone into the community theater here did like a Neil Simon play where I played played the lead in that. And the whole reason behind that was that I had been dabbling as a creative writer, but I was a terrible novelist, <laughs> like just, just awful, but I was trying. And I realized over time, like, oh, I really, I really enjoy writing dialogue and I'm naturally extroverted and I like the theater. So it just all sort of came together. And I was like, well, Maybe I should try this playwriting thing. I realized very shortly after that that it didn't make any sense for me to want to be a playwright without going into the theater. So I kind of joined up with this little theater company here. The opportunity arose to go to London. Uh, I spent a year in London, and I uh, was at the Royal Court in their Young Writers Program, which is quite right. a great program. Uh, very indebted still to them. And uh, the Soho has a program. There's that whole scene in London uh, where they support young writers. Playwrights are taken seriously there. There's a really great theater culture. Uh, obviously, I don't think I need to tell you. Came back, you know, came back, did my, continued to do playwriting. And then I had the good fortune to get on a fellowship at the Playwrights Center here in Minneapolis, which is a quite a big national new play development organization. A lot of playwrights come through there typically now after graduate school, after they get their MFAs. I managed to to win this fellowship before I had my MFA, which was really great because then I could, I was able to apply to these different MFA programs and, and have a little bit of standing already. So it was quite nice. And I was doing, you know, theater here in Minneapolis. There's a great theater in town called uh, Red Eye. I uh, had a little, you know, did a, they commissioned me for a small, you know, a small commission to do a play. I did an adaptation of uh, a Charles Mee play, uh, uh, Iphigenia. So kind of this modern Greek, it was like an adaptation of an adaptation, all very meta and heady. At, long story short, um, I ended up uh, going to Texas for my MFA. So I went to the Michener Center for Writers at UT Austin. Great program. Uh, had, a, had a wonderful three years in Austin. After that, moved to New York City, and then I, I had a play premiere at the Finborough 
I had a play, you know, I've had plays on in New York, uh, Detroit, Dallas, here and there. And, um, yeah, I lived in New York for seven years. I did that. And then nature and, you know, we were already planning on leaving, uh, New York before the, the COVID came. (laughs) We got cut up at the very end of the COVID left or at the very beginning of the COVID, excuse me, left New York came back to Minnesota and landed right in the cauldron of the, uh, the situation with George Floyd. Yes. Well, Waltz is, Waltz is a, uh, a CCP agent as far as I'm concerned. He's, I'm not kidding. If you can look him up, uh, we need to throw this guy out. It's terrible. Look at, look up his Wikipedia. It's just absurd. They're not even hiding it. Like the man is from Nebraska And he was sent to, it says right in his Wikipedia that Harvard, for whatever reason, sent him to China in 1989. And now he's the governor of Minnesota. And Minnesota has one of the harshest lockdown and and, uh, vaccine regimes. Totally a spook. Yeah, yeah, they all, uh, well, yes. Um, So you've been, you're quite recently back in in the Minnesota area then. Now, um, you're the first playwright we've had on. But everyone's been a, a novelist until now. Ah, okay. Um, what? And I don't know anything about writing plays. What is the? What? At what point do you diverge from? Uh, you said you tried your hand. You decided you were no good at fiction. I, I don't believe it. But um, at what? How does the playwright know that his destiny is in that direction, as opposed to fictional? Or poetry, or whatever. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think for me, it was a case of extroversion. I really enjoy interacting with people. It energizes me. And I've exhausted any number of introverts. For whatever reason, I've, in my life, like romantically and even with friendships, I, I have a tendency to sort of match up with introverts. And they tend to, they'll they'll kind of get burnt out at a certain period of time because people and being around people kind of energizes me. And that's a natural fit, I think, for the theater, because plays are not, they're blueprints, they're blueprints, right? And really, ideally, when you write a play, you're writing a blueprint that 10 different companies, 100 different companies, if you're very fortunate, will will do and put their stamp on. Mm-hmm. And you might not even approve of every single iteration of it. And some of the estates are quite intense, right? Like Beckett's estate is very intense about who can do Godot and how it has to be done and all this. I really love when I like seeing different productions of my plays uh, when I'm so fortunate and getting different impressions. And so it's more of a blueprint and it's a, it's more of a collaborative process than, than writing a novel. Novels are also, I mean, if you sit down to write a novel, you're committing an extraordinary amount of time, yeah. uh, and my my co-host of the Art of Darkness podcast, which is at artofdarkpod.com, Brad Kelly, I met uh, him in grad school. He's a novelist, and uh, he would be a great guest for your show, too. I watched him on the I, show. I was going to mention that, yeah. Oh, wonderful. So the um, it's just that there's such an extraordinary commitment to the craft and to – not that we don't have a commitment as playwrights to the craft. There's just a commitment of time sure. to the novel that – it, it didn't it didn't suit my temperament. I like to be like right now I'm really heavy into crypto and I have my my business that I do. And the crypto is a very social thing. I'm a, I, it's funny because my play moderation is about social media content moderators losing their minds at work. And you can find that at moderationplay.com. I have since writing that become a paid moderator. Have you read it? In a crypto chat. It's surreal. It is so <laughs> bizarre. I didn't ask for it. I got into a crypto project really early. It's Floki. It's one. It's so silly, but it, it's quite serious, too. It's named after Elon Musk's puppy. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I, we can get into crypto. I love it. I love the community. Shout out to the Floki Vikings. It's very theatrical. It's very story oriented. And I just got really active in it. And they were like, you're a moderator now. I'm like, what? Wow. <laughs> so strange. Now, I, 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 sorry, I get all your logic, and I, I can see how it's uh, different in terms of the personal in, interpersonal interaction and so on. But your politics isn't exactly um, 
uh, acceptable these days. You, you're, no. what, what I've seen on Twitter and from what, mm. what I've garnered, um, doesn't that very personal interaction in a in the theatre world make it mm. virtually impossible for you to make any progress? I mean, in a, with a novelist, you do you are isolated, and it, it gives you the benefit of at least thinking, well, maybe one day this will, I can put it out there and it'll be uh, you know get success. But you must every every time you. The, production is made you have to go through a series it's not just one editor it's a series of barriers in each playhouse isn't it i mean and these people are not the theater world is is, is hard left these days ha oh i mean yeah they've lost their minds without a doubt by and large um i just i have you know moderation had four different theater companies independently want to do a reading of it by zoom okay and i have my politics and I'm very vocal on Twitter. I, I think that I'm pretty heterodox. I'm not in the tank for one party or, and I'm not a Trumper and I'm not a, do you know, it's like, I'm, I'm a free thinking person. Yeah. And, uh, are, we, we get categorized as hard right yeah. or right or something, but we're mostly just, we've got all sorts of policies and all sorts of issues. Yeah. Um, no, believe me, it's frustrating. I mean, it's, it, you know, I wish that, but also like right now, the American theater is kind of, it's like dead on arrival right now. There's, there's nothing going on. Uh, everything's shut down. They have the craziest restrictions, the craziest policies. Um, but one of my favorite things about theater is how DIY it is. We're starting a theater company here in St. Paul. Uh, it's going to be called Bad Mouth Theater Company. Uh, we're actually going to be announcing our first uh, yeah, bad mouth. Oh, see, I, you're the, uh, you're the target audience for that name. Um, but yeah, it's going to be at bad mouth TC. I love dot, that. Yeah. Dot com. And we're doing a reading series. That's going to be five plays, uh, original. I think a couple of them have already premiered, but we're going to be doing a reading series at a, at a brewery here in town. We haven't announced yet, so I'm not going to say the brewery, but if you follow us at badmouthtc.com, you'll be able to find it. And I encourage everybody, wherever you are, to do that, because for each of these, we are going to be releasing digital content, too. We're going to be doing uh, recordings of each of the readings before the live readings. We're going to make kind of like we're going to do Zoom rehearsals. We're going to record that. You'll be able to hear the plays. I'm also going to interview the playwrights. My point is, like, I love the theater because it is DIY and I don't need to wait for some gatekeeper at some regional theater to anoint me the voice of my generation. Frankly, at this point, I don't give a damn. I don't care. That's, you know, you've enlightened me because I, I see the uh, not being a part of the theater world. I see it as a very structured with gatekeepers and, and formal openings and stuff. But you're right. It can be uh, just done in a pub. If you, in England, it used to be done in pubs. Uh, quite it, I mean, it still is. Uh, the, yeah. the, the biggest production that I've had, uh, which had a Guardian review, I didn't get a great review, but I got reviewed by the Guardian. I'm a kid from a small town in North Dakota who got a yeah. review in the Guardian, you know, and it was uh, Finborough, which is, you know, know first Finbro class. Arms. Yeah, yeah. First class pub theater. And we're going to do something like that here. Uh, I mean, not at the level of Finborough right away, but who knows? Who knows what it grows into? I mean, we build something. And look, I'll tell you something else. Uh, as somebody who has sort of come out on the Bird website as a free thinker, as an artist uh, and a playwright who isn't uh, orthodox and parroting all the right lines and saying all the right things, like people slide into my DMs all the time now including people who work in the theater people who have some people who have like serious standing in the theater will go kevin i can't say this but you're right I, you know it's everybody's kind of losing their minds you know and it's like what what is this east berlin and these people they all think that they're the most progressive and the most hip and the most cool and everybody's so right on and it's like they're they're all walking on eggshells they're all scared of some weird panopticon and you know there's some person who might judge them and it's like if you this is another reason like i'm really really vehement about keeping my own life and my own career aside from the theater i see the theater as part of my life but it isn't the whole of my life and how awful to make that the whole of your life and to be live you know living in fear of every single thing you say publicly and oh god disgusting yeah yeah well um so my brain's reeling because it, it in many ways it is the perfect um guerrilla tactic to introduce culture back into from our perspective it's not online it's not uh, it doesn't have to go through any um 
cloud database. It can be hand, you know, the, the, te the manuscripts tend to be short and simple relative to books and so on. Um, and you can be presenting direct to the audience. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it like that, but you may be opening up a new angle of attack for us to get our word out. Well, and look, if you are strong at writing dialogue, if, if you're writing a novel, you're writing dialogue already. Yeah. Uh, there's an art to writing plays, of course, it's unique to to the play. But I love that you can you can sit down and write a pretty good first draft of a play that's about something happening right now yeah. in yeah. two weeks, yeah. three weeks. Exactly. You know? uh, yep. uh, uh, now I'm thinking of Backlab Harvard and people like that who did all this sort of thing in the behind the Iron Curtain and uh, became prime minister eventually. I can sit, so, well, thanks, you've opened a... <laughs> yeah, I am, my political ambitions begin and end with the Bird website. That's sort of where, where I begin and end. But yeah, yeah, Havel is a great example. And it is, it, you know, yeah, this is, even this conversation gets me kind of excited to to dive into my new play, which um, I'm, I've got a first act. I, I'm going to go to Las Vegas next week and I, I'm going to hold myself. I'm, my my trick, my mental trick is I, I don't think I'm going to let myself go out and have a good time until I write the second act. So I'm going to be there for like 10 days. So the first probably five days are going to be devoted to like hammering out a, a second act and saying and coming home with like a 75, 80 page draft of a play. This is the other beautiful thing about playwriting. You get a draft. You have a little history as a playwright. Like. I can then take it to my actors, to friends of mine, and we'll develop it together from there. So right. there's a certain ju juicy, like kind of almost, I don't want to say laziness, because at the end of the day, I'll be the one writing it, but it's not quite as arduous as being a novelist and committing to a 300 page manuscript on your own, in your own mind. I know novelists work with editors, but there's just nothing like working with actors. Yeah. Before we get to the play itself, um... Who are your influences in the uh, in the playwriting world? Who who, are, who do you look up to as your gurus? Yeah, well, uh, when I that's a, it's a fun question. Somebody DM'd me not long ago asking for a few books to read if they were just if they had an idea for something dramatic, uh, and I I recommend Peter Brook, uh, The Empty Space, as a kind of a seminal text about this. I recommend Mamet. Three Uses of the Knife, uh, and all of his his writing on the theater is great. He's a wonderful uh, polemicist. And, of course, he's now on the right uh, rather yep. famously. Um, and I think he kind of always was, but he he played along. Sure. Uh, you know, he, he can, Mamet can speak for himself. He's said plenty about it. Um, and then the other book I recommend is uh, Arto is The Theater and Its Double. Okay. Uh, if you read those three books on on dramatic writing and then immerse yourself in uh, new plays and in the modern classics, you're going to be great. And then, of course, I just draw my line right from Chekhov, uh, Beckett, uh, No Exit, Sartre, even though he's a man of the left. Like Sartre, is, I read that play when I was in high school and it stuck with me. I was like, wow, you can do that with a play. That is so cool. August Wilson. Uh, fences uh, at, at university here. There was an English teacher who taught fences and I just got so moved. I was so moved by how, just how, how heavy that play is, how it, um, how much it carries, but in such a, like a deft way, like plays, there's that great Miles Davis quote about music is the, no the notes you don't play. Right. And plays are like, plays Very, are like that. Yeah, I can see that. Yes. Yeah, and 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 August Wilson was at the Playwright Center, so I sort of scrolled that away. So you know, a few years later, when I won the fellowship, it was like, wow, this is really cool. Um, Sarah Rule has that great play, Eurydice, which is a just a fabulous uh, play. Carol Churchill, um, Far Away, that's an amazing play. But I and then and then I just that year I spent over over in England um, was just so formative. I actually performed in uh, a small part in and. Uh, Camus ha wrote Caligula, a play about Caligula. People, I don't, not many people know that. So I was in that. So that's that's kind of my tradition. I come from, you know, I have this background in philosophy. So I'm very interested in the way that plays can be containers for ideas. And then, of course, Sam Shepard. I have to mention Sam Shepard, Buried Child, uh, The Curse of the Starving Class, all that stuff. Just good. Yeah, yeah. That's a bit of it. 
contemporary playwrights who are on our side uh, that, that have managed to make a name for themselves, or are they largely? Um, I, I mean, I think yeah, it's it's everybody's very very quiet. If you're not if you're not right on politically, you just sort of like write your plays and do your things, uh, your thing. I don't really know. I mean, I think Neil Butte for a while was maybe kind of unorthodox and not not kind of with the program. But right now, after COVID, COVID was a was a just shut the theaters down for years. So we're kind of reassessing and figuring out what's going on. Curtis Yarvin, the the great Mencius Moldbug, his his wife, his now deceased wife, had a had a phrase for the majority of what happens now in the American theater, which I thought was so funny. She calls it race opera. And that's that is what a lot of this is. It's identity politics. Yeah. Uh, it's this pap that they imbibe from the New York Times and from uh, yeah. from uh, the New Yorker and from Harper's and from NPR. And they chew that up and then just they spit it out for the audience and the audience pats itself on the back for being so right on and everybody's so right on and nobody's actually entertained. The entertainment yeah, comes from- uh, terrible. Yeah, the entertainment comes from from this class of people, the tote bag Americans, validating their own righteousness for voting for Bernie in the primaries, but holding their nose to vote for Biden. And don't we all know we're the right good people, even though America's falling apart around us? Yeah, no, it's it's insufferable. They're the insufferable. Yeah. Well, and they make, it's terrible is, art. Yeah, it is. And this is where your play comes in, and it's the opposite. I am delighted with what I read. I thought I I'm somewhat wary of plays and so on. You know, I've done my fair share at school and Shakespeare and suffered through them mostly. But um, yours is, yeah. is entertaining, it's insightful, it's uh, to the point, there's no heavy baggage carried. Um, altogether, it's a, a delight to be, uh, to, to experience. So we're gonna move on to that. Um, it's described, well, to, to give some context to people, it's, um, Hang on a sec. I've just been interfered with it. Yeah, no worries. It's all it's all good. Yeah, you were talking about moderation, which um, yeah. yeah, no. Um, the it's set in a the it's a two man play, and it's I'm going to let you describe mm -hmm. it mostly. But they they're the moderators in one of these social media firms. I don't know. If, I guess it's YouTube, but it could be Facebook or something. It's left unsaid. Um, and. It's described on one of your pages, I found, it avoids the partisan proselytizing deadliness of polemical issue theatre. Moderation speaks to, to important issues like brain sickness from overexposure to the fringes of the internet and social media, as well as our troubling dependence on big tech, even as it seems to threaten our very humanity. It's a psychological thriller that addresses the ever-growing role of technology, the internet, and particular, in particular violence and degeneracy we find there, but also the nature of truth, censorship, and the toll paid by those who have seen the res responsibility of doing the censoring, as well as the insanity, uh, and it's an important part, as well as the general insanity of our everyday life. Um, it's not political as such, but it's very funny in a dry, gallows humour sort of way. That, that was some of my notes inter interlinked with some of yours. So tell us um, the basic principles behind the play and how they are played out in the course of it, please. Yeah, yeah, and when you were asking about influences, I neglected to mention Pinter, but Pinter is a big one. I think he takes uh, things for granted, isn't he, now? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, and it was so funny because, well, so yeah, moderation is a two-hander, uh, and it's about social media content moderators losing their minds at work. It's based on uh, truth. This is really a thing that has happened and has been happening. There was a an article from uh, an outlet called The Verge that uh, exposes this, that talks about this. Some of these content moderators sued Facebook and won, I think, some millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars for damage, psychological damage. So in a funny way, it's, it, it's a bit of muckraking, this play, comparable to maybe The Jungle from Upton Sinclair, where yes. I was looking at an industry that every, see, and everybody talks about how mental health and we care about mental health, but they don't, they don't really, nobody really does. If they really cared about mental health, they would have handled the COVID business differently, but that's neither here nor there. But it is kind of, it is drawn from this and from, from reality. And 
most of these companies don't employ these content moderators directly because one of the things Facebook likes to lie about is the average salary of its staff, but then they pro they contract out legions of this stuff in every language all around the globe. But these people aren't employed by Facebook, so they right. don't drag the median wage down. So these are like the janitors of the internet. Uh, and they are- Because most of us don't understand the, you know, we don't know the details of this industry. There are tens of thousands of people doing this, isn't there? At first- As, you as might, we speak. Yeah, we, you might think there might be 10 at Facebook or something, but there aren't. There are absolute armies of these people. So it's yes. a very, you know, it's, it's a modern issue. It's not just some niche hidden away in Silicon Valley. No, and it's only going to become more extreme. There's going to be more of this. And, you know, and I'm the, the moment that told me to write this play. I, I had this play in the back of my mind for a long time. But there was a moment and I think it might have been the Verge article or it might have been another article about this that I knew, ah, this is the play was when it might have been the Atlantic or one of these lefty outlets that that said something like they were because they they were so horrified to discover that some of these content moderators were beginning to believe the conspiracy theories they were moderating and i thought it's a, such a beautiful premise you, you the, the content you've chosen was perfect because it lets you get into the middle of everything the middle of the internet the middle of what's truth and censorship and all the issues that are raised on the internet, whether they're conspiracy theories or politics, it's a brilliant, it puts you at an epicenter of all these things. And, it, and the way the play develops exploits this brilliantly. So go on, sorry to interrupt. No, that's very kind. And I realized too, sort of the structural breakthrough I had when I began to write the play was to simply, and this is, this is one of the things that theater does so well that no other medium does. Uh, is because you have the poetic suspension of disbelief, uh, I simply had the characters start to describe what they were moderating and describe their inner world. I am being a social content moderator. I am seeing a so-and-so. And I did this slightly different thing with the tense, right? So they are always um, doing the thing yep. when they're speaking about. And that was a breakthrough. Because then I then I could sort of do a trick the way that like a musical does where like they break into song and then now we're talking like normal people. I was able to switch, do this code switch, this mode switch from the moderation itself to the regular conversation. That was a huge breakthrough because then it, what it allows me to do, and this is again what theater does so well. It's like, it goes all the way back to Shakespeare. It goes back to the Greeks, right? If you're at a play and it's a Shakespeare play and the one of the characters says, you know, lo, I stand on the field of war. You go, okay, they're in the field yeah. of war. Like, yeah, here we go. So <laughs> I love that about the theater. So I was able to do that with this moderation business. And it was only after I wrote the play and I started to, working on it with people did I realize the play follows the structure in a funny way of the dumb waiter, the, the pinter play where there's a dumb waiter on stage and it's feeding new things into the scene periodically. And that's how moderation works, except the thing being fed into the scene periodically is the content that they're being well, forced yes. to moderate. Which is many, you know, there's, that's something we're trying to get to grips with still. The internet can provide one minute it's kittens and the next minute it's the twin towers and the next minute it's the latest film or whatever but it gives you the opportunity to exploit these avenues as at your choosing um it's not political as such i think i have to uh well it, it, no it's there's no uh, certainly no party politics and very little principle politics involved but it um it triggers uh it raises a lot of issues and questions about the the role of um, social media, the role of the internet going forward. It, it, um, where was, what was your goal there? What, what are you trying to highlight? Because there are dangers and there are positives. It's, it's, it's clear. Um, where do you fall? Yeah. Well, I think, like so many people, I'm wrestling with it. And it's the thing that all of us, I think, for the remainder of our lives, yeah. We'll be wrestling with 
it's the the advent of the internet and of social media is the most important event of our lifetimes. It's yes. bigger than 9-11. Yes. Um, yeah. Maybe the only bigger phenomenon in the past hundred years are the pill and the nuclear explosion. Yeah. Yeah. And so we just have to, re- it, we have to wrestle with it in everything. I wrote another play about the internet kind of 10 years too early. I wrote a play about uh, online sex workers, cam models. Uh, and that premiered in 2011. It was called, yeah. If You Start a Fire, Be Prepared to Burn. And we adapted that into a ser- little comedy series. You can find that at moneyshotshow.com. But I was wrestling this w- with this a long time ago. Uh, and so for me, a lot of it, it comes down to like talking about this thing that matters so much, which seems to not be discussed that much. It seems to kind of be like assumed well, now we all have the internet and we're all online and we're connected 24 seven with people all over the globe. And I guess that's just how it is now. Instead of really just pausing to go, wait, Wait. this isn't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gone. No, no, this is the thing. This, we have to write and talk (laughs) about this thing. Not every single play, but you know, I'm a, I'm a man of a certain age and I remember dialing a, a rotary phone at my great aunt and great uncle's house uh, you know, and then a month later being, di- you know, dialing up on AOL. Yeah. It's we and it's surreal. And it's a, I think it's important that we write plays and make art and make content about this thing. Uh, to try and understand it's just, it better. Yes. To try and understand it better. Yes. Now, the two, yep. the two main characters, they um, one's being mentored by the other one's subservient to the other. But um, hmm. because of the way the the world is today and the, the, the role the way these funny social media co- policy companies have st- strange policies the, the, the tables were easily turned it seems by the end um and it's really the effect of the play describes the effects of this strange new world we're in um it's not just them in their little basement doing their job specifically it's it's us as a as victims and as exploiters too, if you like, of the whole system that we're, the new system that we're in, and their story is almost like a parable or an analogy to to modern societies. We, we, we're not sure if we're captured by this new beast, or if we're trying, or if we, if we, we like to think we've tamed it, maybe. But it's really much much more complicated wow. than that. Yeah, and the anxiety that people have about this is so oppressive and we don't talk about it people will go you know everybody's staring at their phone uh you know they'll gripe at the most fundamental level but it's like wow we are really rewiring our brains and the we are really heading into something where we don't have language for it is this still capitalism what is this I, i don't know anymore i don't think anybody does i don't think anybody really i guess you call it techno capital uh and they've definitely happily locked everybody down for a number of years and forced the 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 working class behind masks and plastic barriers and forced the the PMC class which is sort of happy to have the sabbatical to work on, work on Zoom we send a few emails and you know it's just it's so bizarre and yeah, we, we need to wrestle with this. And I hope the play does that. The other f- good reason for this to be a play, although I, we do want to adapt it into a, a film. Uh, I have a great screenwriting partner over in London. Uh, her name's Abby Lucas, abbylucas.com. She's fantastic. She directed uh, some of the Money Shot shorts. I think she yeah directed those. And then she's getting ready to direct her first feature film as well. But we're screenwriting partners. We want to adapt it into a film because of th- simply the way that it can reach more people and people do seem to respond. And I think it could be a great film adaptation if we do it right. However, it is meant to be a play. And there's something about the contrast of this subject matter with two people in the room and everybody watching with their phones off that I think when we finally get to do it live, I think it, I think it has the potential to do something really moving. Yeah. One thing I've picked up on, I think you, tried to have that. I reckon you highlighted it on purpose is the for all its faults the internet and the YouTubes of the world and stuff the the mass exposure to subjects which have never 
been able, we've never been able to discuss before. It, it has been beneficial in many ways. The individuals in the, the play are affected in a positive way. Well, in my opinion, and probably yours, um, in that they come to see that what they had written off as sheer quackery and nonsense, and um, we call them conspiracy theories, but um, by having to watch these things day in, day out, um, doubts settle in their minds and gradually they come to see, and I think this is where the internet will probably have the most long-lasting impact. It's many, well, one of its many impacts will be that uh, the truth finally did get out through the internet, maybe hidden amongst cat videos and a billion wasted hours of other stuff. But uh, in amongst there, there's a few diamonds that can be found. And, um, like your podcast, no doubt. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. And I think that the cat is out of the bag. I'm big in crypto. I think crypto is the next, the next revolution. I really Dimension believe this. Yes. Yeah. One thing that the internet does is that it accelerates everything. It has made right. everything faster. And now finance, if finance is really disrupt, uh, disrupted the same way that communication was disrupted and entertainment yeah. was disrupted, that it's does over. have, it's over. That does have the potential to liberate more people from the intergenerational uh, meta slavery from this spreadsheet slave system that these, um, uh, that these central banks use to manipulate and maneuver people around. If that if that comes undone, it will mean probably a lot of chaos, but a lot of liberty and a lot of freedom. And I am one of these people that sees the potential of that in crypto. And I am also somebody who has been a bit radicalized. I've always been kind of like this, but I you know maybe a little oppositionally defiant, a little skeptical, let's say, of authority. I've always been this way. But this past three years, two, three years with COVID has <laughs> between, between COVID and Epstein. Yes. I've just full blown anarchist. All, as far as I'm concerned, all government is crime and it's up yeah. to them. It's on them to prove their validity to me because I'd never, I didn't sign up for any of this stuff. And it's clear as day to me that there's some sort of a cartel or a mafia or a mob or whatever you want running things. And I'm, I don't, and I think there are a lot more people who think like I do than there were before, because I don't know how you look at the past three years and go, Oh, this is normal. This is fine. I don't, a lot of it. people do, of course, but there's, yeah, you're right. There's an absolute tidal wave. I get, I get the impression it's a tidal wave and a lot of them probably had reservations all along, but now they feel a little bit more secure in saying something because you know, after two years in isolation and all the other nonsense, they've, they've, they've come to the conclusion there's nothing to lose almost. Um, and there are more people well, speaking out at the time. Well, and it's such an awful thing, too, to write this play, because I wrote this play in 2019. And then to have the world kind of, like, catch up to the darkness of the play. And yes. every, without exception, every theater that's wanted to work on it, because there, again, have been four different readings of it, on Zoom by four different theaters. So this isn't just in my mind, right? There's a play here. People want to do it. Uh, yeah. They've all said, gosh, Kevin, I hate to say your play is just so right on. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like, it was <laughs> It was meant to be, it wasn't meant to be this, you know. Oh, God, you know. Uh, yeah, so anyway. But you have caught the zeitgeist. There's no question. You, yes. you pinpointed yes. it. That the, the real heart of everything that right now comes down to these two people. You can be explored through these two people in a basement of all things. Um, yeah, for, for people who don't understand that uh, until they've seen the play, maybe I, I had no idea what these moderators went through, but their whole life is monitored to, to in Orwellian terms. I mean, every click of every keypad uh, and every, um, even their eye movements, I think, you, you know, attract. Um, they, they can't go to the toilet when they want to. They And, and even then they have to Call it a bio break, and they're completely <laughs> ro roboticized, aren't they? And um, the personality. Well, and, I, and, and just to be clear, some of those things are poetic license, right? Like okay. every every single company, I don't know their policies about this or that, but it's uh, you know we all heard the story about. It could well be the opposite. It could well be they're even more closely monitored than that we let on. But go on, yes. 
No, yeah, of course. I mean, but we all know the story about the people at Amazon who were wearing diapers because they had yeah. quotas. Yeah, we're who knows? I mean, and look, if these tech people have their way, it's just going to be like that. It's going to be eat the bugs, live in the pod, and your job is going to consist of logging in every day yeah. and ha basically yeah. being MK Ultraed uh, as you are forced into being the janitor of the human id. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're like prototypes for us. Not only, yeah, that's a very good point that, that, that you can see that that is the future, barring um, us making our voices heard. You mentioned that you've always been like this. It's a question I always ask the guests. <laughs> but, um, North Dakota famously, uh, for those who don't know, maybe um, it's very bleak, it's very flat, there's hundreds of miles to go to the cinema sometimes. Um, was I, And I always think that people come from those backgrounds, the, their imagination must run riot as a child because they can't be in New York City, they can't see the skyscrapers yeah. in the foreign country, you know, everything is just monotonous yeah. and, and, and even the climate's pretty, I know you get mm. your seasons, but it's, it's either all white with snow or it's all hot with sun, there's no, mm. um, do you put it down to that at all, that you just, your imagination ran wild and you wanted to sort of investigate? Man, that's so interesting. Uh, it's really fun. There is a, there's a wonderful poem that, that John Updike wrote. And maybe when we, and I'm not, I'm not shutting us down now, but maybe when we close, we can close on this poem, uh, that, uh, that Updike wrote that you made me think of. Let me open Skype back up. There we are. Um, well, uh, the, the fact of the matter is I was raised by school teachers. My mother read to me, uh, and made reading an absolute mandate in our house. Uh, when I was, uh, very young, my father passed away, uh, from actually from an opioid overdose, which, uh, is the subject of my next, my next play. And it, it was an overdose on something called propoxyphene, which if you Google this, you can look up Darvon Darvaset. This thing never should have been on the market. Yeah. It's surreal. Absolutely tragic. Now, uh, I'm a long way from that and, you know, where everybody's doing great and, and we made it, but that was, uh, it made my childhood. So you're talking about an already pretty bleak place. Yes. It made my childhood pretty Dickensian, uh, to say the least. And we had a lot of good people. There was a lot of like love around it. I, I don't want to paint a certain picture, but it was not the easiest childhood. And then you throw on top of that, the burning embers of literacy and, reading yeah. uh and letters and books and i was just such a bookish kid like to a fault um it's actually one of the things that i like about the theater again is that you know the bookish kid turned into the internet kid when i was a teenager and the theater is a way to kind of like extract yourself you can't be on your phone when you're making a play you can't be on your phone when you're in the theater so it yeah. re it immerses you back in the the real in the physical and in the real um, and moderation, I think, is an is an attempt to do that. And of course, it's ironic that it would be read on Zoom all these times. But yeah, a difficult childhood makes for artists. I mean, you know, and art art of darkness comes from this. We find this all the time. Children of alcoholics, alcoholics themselves, addiction, dead parents, just the worst stuff. And then there, hey, there comes a great novel. <laughs> Sorry, and Richard, the, you're gonna say. the political alignment that you found that came at what point in your trajectory as you well i remember in high school being a terrorist practically uh not not in the strict sense but i mean I, i'm sure i terrorized a lot of people we were the we were the uh trench coat kids during the columbine time before columbine happened oh, we were the ones who wore black and kind of and listened to tool and marilyn manson and nine inch nails and kmfdm and Vumschgut and all this stuff and then a bunch of like goth stuff from from the uk actually i was really into out in north dakota in the 90s totally nuts uh good stuff though i still I still love this stuff. Um, I got, I was like into dead can dance when I was 15. Like I, I applaud myself at 15 for having taste like that. Um, <laughs> they're a great band. I went, I flew over to London to go see them live. That was a bucket list show for me. But, um, you know, I remember I worked at, see, this is an interesting thing. Answering your question. I gravitated toward working at a, a video store 
back when there were VHS tapes. And I was there during the, the great transition from VHS to DVD. And I watched everything. I, they didn't even have to pay me. I don't even think that I was there for the money, really. I don't even remember. I, it was just I wanted to – every night I would bring home two tapes, and then, I, and then I got into my Woody Allen streak. I watched everything. I got into Bergman. I watched everything. Kurosawa, I watched everything. And I just consumed all of this stuff. And there was no way you were going to keep me down on the farm after that. Right. <laughs> yeah. The political angle sort of evolved. Ah, yes, yes, yes. No, right. Oh, so I, I was going to say, so I remember uh, in high school, I was working at this video store. And they we had this big printer, uh, like an industrial printer. And well, maybe not industrial, but a commercial grade heavy duty printer. And I got, I was online. I was already very online when I was a teenager, uh, too online. And um, I, uh, I got a sheet, uh, like a PDF or whatnot, a document uh, about how American public schools were like prisons, how they were similar. And, and someone's printed, been doing a meme on that recently, and it's absolutely stunning yeah. from the buses that take you there to the dining halls to the. It's everything. it's totally Soviet. It's completely it's it's totally Soviet. It's it's Soviet. It's Soviet America. Yeah, we're we're going to be homeschooling. It's charter yeah. schools are homeschooling. Yeah, yeah, we should completely dismantle the teachers unions. It yeah. should all be torn torn to pieces. Um, and my parents are teachers, so this is a long way for me to come to this conclusion. Right. But I, even as a teenager, I printed that out. I distributed, you know, 500 copies of that around the school. I don't know if anybody knew it was me, but that was all anybody was talking about that day. And yeah. I, the way I did it is I gave 10 copies to, or like 50 copies to 10, 10 of my friends or whatever it was. Yeah. So I've been that way for a long time. And then I was always skeptical about nine 11 and da da da. So I've, you know, it's, it, it hasn't been that far for me to, to come to this conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell us about the, your own podcast, The Art of Darkness, which is a lovely title, by the way. Um, yeah. Jealous. Go on. What, what, what's the... <laughs> explores the dark side of creative, the creative process. But go on. What's yeah. That yeah. Art of Darkness is a podcast that I do with Brad Kelly, who's a fine novelist. Uh, and you can find it at Art of Dark Pod. We're on Twitter at Art of Dark Pod. And then if you go to artofdarkpod.com, you can find us. We have a Telegram channel now, uh, which is fun. A lot of time on Telegram. This is a show about the dark side of creativity. So it's about the people who, uh, who are artists, thinkers, creative people. Uh, and they're all dead. We don't do anybody who's still These alive. Like William S. Burroughs. Um, Burroughs. Uh, we haven't done Hemingway yet, but I can't wait because I, yeah. I spent years, I got a commission from History Theater here in St. Paul to do a play about Hemingway years ago. It was never, it has yet to be produced, but people don't know this. Hemingway uh, had not one, but two rounds of electroshock therapy at the end of his life at Mayo Clinic down in Rochester here. He he okay. very nearly ended his life in Minnesota. He killed himself. He blew his brains out five days after leaving Mayo Clinic the second time. It's okay. very interesting history there. He, they were giving him electroshock therapy against his will. Um, but yes, yeah, we're going to do Hemingway. That's going to be a banger. Uh, but yeah, we, we did Kubrick. We did Virginia Woolf. Uh, we just did, for the first time, uh, someone who passed away. But we wait a year, a minimum a year and a day out of respect because we don't want to ambulance chase or whatnot. We don't want to be creepy. So we did MF Doom. And if you don't know MF Doom, he's a, he's a great rapper. You've got to listen to the album Mad Villainy. Uh, if you have the, that great Gorillaz album, uh, so Demon it Days. Encapsulate the whole of the art world. It's not just uh, literature and so on. It's. Can be yeah, high, high brow, low brow, middle brow, no brow, any brow. We're we're down. I mean, and we're we're also doing at the same time James Joyce, and it's fun because we're we're going. Oh, MF Doom has a lot in common with James Joyce. They were doing this and that, and just really cool and fun. And, and we do our core episodes, and the way that works is Brad will lead one episode, so he led MF Doom. So I come in going, okay, this is what I know about MF Doom. I haven't really gone out of my way to do some research. Here I am. Oh, Tell me about MF Doom. Yeah. And then we'll flip it and I'll I'll 
walk him through Kubrick. So it's fun. It's kind of like a thing we would do anyway for ourselves. And yeah. I think that comes across because it's like we're really enthusiastic about this. We're trying to get to the bottom of this thing that art is and what moves people to do it in a world where now for political reasons and for other reasons, because of this hyper connectivity, we're very quick to cancel people. And yeah. it's like, uh, David Bowie, they had some problems. Kubrick had some problems. Virginia Woolf had some problems. It's like it's 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 worth focusing on that as and and kind of the the subtext of the show is that the show is a little bit anti Puritan okay. because there's this new Puritanism sure it where it's like and it's like we're not making excuses. Like Brando was a monster. The, of all the characters who we've done so far, all of the subjects we've done so far, Brando's the one that shocked me the most as just being monstrous, yeah. but a genius, yeah, a, a genius. And I'll watch Streetcar every six months as a playwright, and and obviously huge, huge. So that's kind of what the show's about. And uh, we also do episodes now where we have guests come on after a given episode. And this is for you too, Richard. If you if you see an episode that you really like, and you know you're welcome to come on. We do episodes. Um, we call them uh, the dark room. So somebody comes on and talks about an episode we just did and kind of deepens it. So, cause everybody had, this is another thing that's fun. It's like you find very quickly, everybody has their, their artists that once yeah. you say Kubrick, like some people just go, ah, and yeah, they, sure. they're just, ah, uh, it's wonderful. So I really, we're really enjoying the show. It's starting to do a little bit of numbers and hopefully one day, you know, it, it reaches a lot of people. These podcasts are tough, right? Cause it's sort of like either Joe Rogan or nothing, but we're, <laughs> we're slightly above nothing. <laughs> oh, I think it's uh, it's quite a nice place to be, slightly above nothing. It's um, you, no pressure on anyone, and um, we, you get to explore the corners of the, the world which no one else has done. So I quite enjoy, it, I must say. So you say there's one more play in line. It's to do with your father's death, untimely death. Um, do you want to give us a hint of where that, what that's going to cover, other than basic? Yeah, you're going to make me. Uh, you're going to make me finish it, aren't you? You're going to make me finish <laughs> writing it. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and when I say it's about my father's overdose, it's, it's about an overdose and it's about the so-called crisis and it's about pain and what it does to families. So it's not uh, biographical by any means, neither is moderation. Like it was funny. I wrote moderation and not a few people, Ask ask me if I was okay <laughs> after moderation. I'm like, I'm fine. Like, what do you? I'm actually great. I just finished a play that I think is pretty good. Like, people have this funny thing where, yeah, it must it's hard for them to. It no, it's hard for them. They're always going like, oh, you're just writing yourself, and it's like, well, no, no, yeah. not really. So so the the new play is going to be called The Animals, and it's about a veterinarian who herself is a uh, an addict. Uh, as she tries to kick and hold her job down, working overnight at a veterinary clinic, a 24 seven veterinary clinic in Minneapolis during the unrest. Uh, and that's what the play's about. <laughs> so I'm- The unrest being the, the rioting. Yeah, the rioting and the, yeah, and the trial and all the rest of it. Okay. That's the backdrop. Hopefully you'll get a chance to put the boot into Big Pharma while you're writing about all these uh, opioid suppliers because they deserve all the kicking they can get. They killed. They killed my father, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And I don't. And I'm not a science truster. Uh, and I don't think anybody should be. I don't think these people have our best interest in mind. I think it's all about the bottom line and control. And I think we're in this kind of. I don't even know. Again, we don't have a word for it. I don't think it's been about the money for a long time. They print the money out of thin. They've got yeah. the money. They've got enough money for it to last them to infinity and beyond. Um, it's yeah. Beyond that, um, I agree, and that's a, very hard to convince people because if you do yeah. finally get them to break out of the matrix, the first thing they think of were, oh, but it must be the money. But that's just like a, a fault, another false flag or another red herring is to keep you from looking at the real. Yes. Yes. And a great example of that on Art of Darkness is the Disney episode we did with uh, Blauergeist, who's an Internet personality. Great Twitter follow if you don't follow Blauer. You look at Disney and it, you doesn't add you up. have to just. No, it doesn't add up. And you look at I mean, Disney was the 
media slash propaganda arm of the United States government during World War II. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, it never stopped. Yeah. It's still that. And if you if you're if you can't see that or how they use that to manipulate people and populations and how the the Ur conspiracy, the Ur agenda is always population control. They they want to control the number of children people are having and they want to control your movement and your ability to maneuver in the world. Well, they move freely among the world yeah. and have as many children as they want and, and and have their bunkers and their third and fourth homes and all the rest of it. It really does boil down to that one. And that's way a way bigger concern of theirs than money. Money, they don't it's just it's it's ooh, fugazi fugazi. They'll print more money. They'll it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. 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 Yep. Fun. Times, but we, and we know. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we. Yep. There you go, Richard. We solved we're on, it. We're on the same lines. All right. Um, a John Updike poem you promised us. Is he still there? Ah, yeah. All right. Well, I will. Yeah, I'll give my plug. So I'm Kevin Kautzman. It's kevinkautzman.com. K-A-U-T-Z-M-A-N. Moderationplay.com. Art of Dark Pod. Uh, dot com. That that's probably enough. I got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> I think I. Well. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity. It's nice. I've I've done a number of podcasts myself where I've interviewed people and it's nice to be in, on the other side of it to like get to kind of vent a little. And you've got me excited about writing my new play. I try to write a new play every year. So I, I hope that it's something that people like. And I hope you enjoy moderation, too, if you get a chance. Listeners, if you get a chance to go to moderationplay.com. Um, let me find the Updike poem because this is so good. I like to imagine um, John Updike in Fargo, uh, North Dakota, which if you've seen the movie, I'm going to have to search for it again. Just hang on one second. If you've seen the movie, right, try and imagine John Updike uh, <laughs> in the middle of winter, um, you know, maybe on a college tour, right? And he's he was just in Minneapolis and now he's now he's gone to Fargo and here he is. So let me read this poem. Uh, the fertilest soil this side of the Tigris and Euphrates, so the school children of that countryside are taught. Of their land, flat as a checkerboard to the hem of the sky, the giant sky, pale green at dusk, stays black long after morning cow milking time. Wind is incessant in winter, so that snow falls sideways like Arctic sunshine. This land of Lutherans and sugar beets thickens its marvelous thinness here at the edge of a red river whose windings alone betray the rectilinear. Downtown, parking space is no problem, and grain-fed health rewards those God's grandeur does not drive mad. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I, get, I get, get the point at the end. It's very good. Excellent. Well, Kevin, Some of us go a little mad and we stay mad. I am, I, I'm, too, too, too true. Thank you very much. A super uh, chat. Um, my first foray into the world of theatre, and it won't be the last. If you've got any recommendations for someone else in a later episode, I'll be grateful. Um, congratulations on writing a spectacularly um, successful, to my mind, uh, play that really entertains and makes you think at the same time, which is what really what we're, we're all about at this channel. And Hopefully, we'll get you back. You say you've already committed to writing your next play this year, so it's, it's on video now. And we've got proof, and we'll be back hounding you this time next year for uh, the next episode. That's awesome, Richard. And I, I do hope on the theater side, people will follow Bad Mouth Theater Company. It's badmouthtc.com. We're going to put out some good content this year, including more about moderation and some other cool plays. Sounds good. I look forward awesome. to it. All the best.